Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Ivan Rusin. I, I'll moderate the uh, session six, which is opportunities for new approaches, implications of new data to inform risk assessment and regulatory decisions. Again, this particular workshop is on new science. However, we do want to make sure that we not only talk about new and exciting science, but also whether it may or may not be usable by regulators. So this particular discussion panel is uh, going to tackle the issues that are here on the board. And we have uh, a number of distinguished uh, members of the panel, and some of them were presenters yesterday. So I'll just, uh, you know, going to go and uh, without, you know, many introductions for those who were introduced yesterday. Wei Shui Chu is uh, EPA's um, Office of Research and Development at National Center for Environmental Assessment. Uh, unfortunately, Dan Sharp from CDC and NIOSH could not come, so we'll miss him on this panel. And uh, Jim Caput uh, is with Nestle, but was with uh, NCTR FDA before that. And Bill Slicker is, of course, the director of NCTR uh, Food and Drug Administration and incoming president of the Society of Toxicology. And uh, Dan Axelrad is uh, also at EPA, but he's at Office of Science Policy. So we're trying, you know, even though we are EPA loaded, our EPA colleagues are coming from, uh, you know, different perspectives. And on the phone, we have Zach Pekar. He's uh, with the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Uh, so what we will try to do in this panel, we'll try to uh, stick to questions because the committee worked very hard to make sure that we frame the discussion maybe from some of the general issues to now, you know, some of the practical issues. There's a lot of exciting science there, but is it ready or should it be used? And if it should be used, how can it be used in decision making? So uh, we did uh, prepare five questions and what I intend to do, I'll uh, spend about 10 minutes on every question. We'll, uh, we have asked one of the panelists to maybe open uh, with uh, you know, some statements regarding that particular question, and then I'll get a reaction from other panel members. And then if uh, those who want to participate from the audience can you know, look at these questions before they go to the microphone, I think that would be a good uh, uh, logistic way for us to, to go about. So without further ado, I uh, wanted to ask uh, Jim Caput to uh, give us his thoughts on question one, and I think the key words in this question one are, you know, populations, can we define populations, and then, uh, you know, what can be done to inform these populations about protection? So, Jim. Yeah, so I want to keep my comment short just so that, because I talked quite a bit yesterday, but I was going to show two slides, and I was going to remind all of you are Americans, so you probably saw this show, Jeopardy, in which IBM Watson played Jeopardy uh, in February. And I don't know if you read the background on what Jeopardy did, what IBM Watson did. Uh, so there's an article that I read about it, and in a sense, they um, targeted 200 million pages of published and unpublished information, structured and unstructured. And what they did is they had an algorithm, a set of algorithms that looked at what they called expert data and soft data. So they threw nothing out. They put it all into the, into the uh, search algorithm. The key factors was they, didn't, they did not use one algorithm to get the uh, answer out. They actually looked at over 100 different techniques or algorithms and then rated the probability that the algorithms gave them the right answer. I actually went to IBM Zurich and met with this group as a small group of other companies and asked the key question, I thought, which is, how did you rate the algorithms, right? And unfortunately, they didn't tell us that. <laughs> they said, you know, look for it in publications. So you got to look for Ferrucci's name, who's the chief architect. But here's, a, here's the issue, at, which has been raised consistently through these days, is that there are too many chemicals, there's too many risk factors, there's too much individual variation. So how are we going to really address this and make a meaningful impact, not 10 years from now or not 20 years from now, but faster? So my view is that we have to have a broader scientific community that looks across the population to do complica complicated experiments together, not just the nutritionist looking at nutrition, the toxicologist looking at toxicology, the, the geneticist looking at genetics, but work together in some targeted fashion. But we also have large amounts of data in the public domain from census uh, information, from health statistics, from a huge variety of different um, what we would call soft 
data that's out there, and we don't even look at it when we, when we are looking at our analysis. So when I was working in the Delta of Arkansas, the, the community asked, how come we're not looking at pesticides? And NCTR, in, in a series of discussions, decided that we better not do that because that's more EPA. So that's problem one. There's some politics. But it is true that, that next to the school and next to the community center, we had pesticides. And a, a, they would be sprayed because it's a huge farming community, and we couldn't look at that. So we needed a more complex structure of scientists involved. But there are data about disease incidents that I found on websites that, unfortunately, I'm not good enough in math and statistics to bring that in to assess whether or not there is a problem or what that problem could be in that population. And then I could have data mined why my 1 million SNP chip data or soon 5 million or soon Gen uh, whole genome and ask questions about the variants that are responsible for phase one and phase two response for the toxins or pesticides that would be in that environment. So what I'm arguing for here is that we got to start opening our mind and our approaches to our scientific processes or problems, particularly in the toxicology field, to start thinking broadly about using other data sets that are currently available. I'm certainly not the expert in doing that, but I think that there, you know, this, this committee might very well bring that to bear in a future topic about how we would go about analyzing all of these data to start making more meaningful impacts or risk assessments. I think we could start doing this tomorrow, not five or ten years from now. Uh, Jim, so I'll just end at that. Yeah, but let me ask you a follow-up question. I, I I think what I'm hearing is that you're advocating for more science, and I think this is clear that more science will occur and more team science will occur. But uh, the, the real question, and whether maybe you have a perspective of someone else on the panel, is what is this science going to tell us? Is it going to tell us who's susceptible, or is it going to tell us how we, you know, have safer chemicals or, or how we do protection. So what is that new science is going to tell us first and foremost, in your opinion? I think it's the combination of all of the different disciplines, and that's been part of the problem, is that in our community here in America in particular, we focus on, we give money to geneticists who do genetics, risk assessments or whatever. We, we give money to nutritionists who do nutrition. We give money to toxicologists. And all of that is separate data that is not put together. So the argument for the science is, we have to connect the dots of the scientific community. And we will find individual variation with that type of approach if we can get the right algorithms to sort it out. And it will be with the, the exposure that we could measure in each individual as we, do this, uh, as we do the studies. So that's what I would argue. I know it sounds like, you know, every scientist says let's do more. What I'm say saying is we have to have harmonized protocols. We have to have deeper teams working together in order to generate all of the data necessary to make the risk assessments. Thank you. Uh, maybe I can get a perspective from Dan or a Weishui, you know, as, uh, you know, as agency representatives that actually does do risk uh, assessment and some policy decisions as well. So what would new science, in your opinion, kind of bring? Is it, you know, what do you care, or not you, but the agency would care first for? Populations that are susceptible to understand what they are or replacement of chemicals? Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take my best shot at it, I guess. Um, I guess, uh, to, to me, where it starts with is, do we really have a good handle on the extent of human variability in response to um, chemical exposures to a particular chemical for a particular endpoint and so forth. Um, so we do, for um, chemicals that have extensive epidemiological evidence, we have some insights into that, um, which were covered yesterday in some of the talks about particulate matter and lead and so forth. Um, but even then, with all the epidemiological evidence we have on particulate matter, it's still sort of rudimentary how much do we know um, about the variability and what are the factors that define that variability or how do you define what are those susceptible subpopulations. I think one of the interesting questions, I think 
this, if I understood George Daston's question yesterday, I was sort of getting at this, is uh, are we talking about a continuum or are we talking about separate identifiable identifiable groups. We sort of tend to think now about, especially in the reference dose context, it's what's the right size of an uncertainty factor to account for human variability going from the median to the sensitive pop population. Well, if the sensitive population is entirely qualitatively different from the typical one, then this idea of doing an extrapolation from the median to the sensitive really uh, to me, it doesn't make logical sense because you're really talking about separable, separable groups. So I'm hoping that uh, we can get more definition on this idea of are we really talking about, when you're talking about genetic susceptibilities or whatever other factors might be driving a differential response, is it something where we're really talking about uh, differences along a continuum or are they really qualitative differences where you have a group of, we could call them responders and non-responders? Wish we don't have to say anything if you want to hold to the, uh, you know, some of the questions that we'll have uh, later on. But uh, again, I would like to remind the audience, if you would want to, you know, chime in into the discussion, you know, please go to the microphone as you see the particular uh, question being discussed. So uh, I, I think that the second question I wanted to uh, bring Bill into this conversation is, is following on, you know, better science and collecting better information. So, uh, you know, we, no one is questioning that better information is needed, but I think what we are discussing is what type of information is needed because there's, you know, information, you know, may be integrated by a computer uh, in, in, this, in the sense of, you know, Watson case, but we're really not talking about, you know, Watson doing risk assessment anytime soon. I hope not. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, and take part in this discussion. Uh, you know, I think that uh, some of the solution of moving from uh, these scientific advances into making uh, really good uh, health decisions is based on partnerships. And uh, Jim alluded to some of these, some of the other speakers have as well. Uh, the, the idea is that uh, as regulators, and I'm speaking from now from my own personal point of view here because, as you know, the NCTR is really focused on generating data sets for decision making and generating new technologies, and I'm not part of the decision making process. But for those that are, uh, they oftentimes, of course, need to follow rules and statutes and guidelines. And, and so one of the partnerships that we haven't talked about very much is a partnership, partnership with the legislative bodies that help define the rules that the regulators will follow. So I think that's one thing that we need to bring into this equation. Uh, the, the other area, of course, is partnerships with all the different agencies. And, and you certainly alluded to the idea of EPA and FDA and others working together. I think that that really is critical when you're talking about trying to uh, move the process forward and understand how you can incorporate uh, data into safety and risk assessment. You know, I think one of the questions is, is what sort of data should be available for risk assessors, assessors to use. And, and of course, uh, one, of the, one of the examples of this is, is very controversial, so I won't use its real name, I'll just use the code name, BPA. Uh, so uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and so what has been done here is I think it's only fair for hopefully uh, people within government and outside of government to also bring possible solutions to these issues, not just to find the problem, but the, the issue is, is you know, what sort of data can be incorporated into a safety assessment. And so, one way to advance this uh, is, is a partnership between NIEHS and, and NTP, as well as between NCTR and FDA and NTP. And we're doing this uh, in a way to evaluate uh, bisphenol A in, in, in a sort of a new way. Um, it's certainly going to be based on the exposures uh, to bisphenol A over multiple uh, dose ranges, including dosing the mom and, and the neonates, and doing it, of course, in low doses as well as medium doses. Uh, but it's also where char well characterized feed, uh, well characterized water, caging, et cetera. So, under GLP conditions at the NCTR, but in partnership with 12 grantees from NIEHS. And this is kind of a novel approach so that many of the endpoints that the various grantees would like to apply can be applied to this group of animals uh, that's well characterized in terms of their exposure, uh, the plasma levels, the BPA, all the other considerations that are involved in this kind of a a good laboratory practice type of uh, experiment. So I think this is, uh, shows a partnership that maybe will help move this process forward, uh, how to uh, use the, the, the approaches that have been defined in the regulation that are used to routinely to make decisions with, 
with uh, some of additional endpoints uh, that some of the investigators from uh, NIHS are going to bring to it, and grantees and, as well. And to bring that together to try to answer these questions and sort of form a new model about how you would go about doing some of these safety assessments. Now, this, this is an interesting experiment. It's actually going to be kicked off uh, later on this summer. Uh, and it is an experiment. We don't know how the outcome is going to turn out. But I, I do appreciate the, the work that uh, Linda Birnbaum and, and John Bucher and Jerry Heindel from NIEHS and, of course, Barry Delclose, who's a PI at NCTR, as well as Paul Howard and Fred Beal, all working together, along with many other, the 12 grantees and their groups, uh, to make this happen. So I really think that this kind of approach may be able to generate data sets uh, that are, are uh, more realistic to to making uh, important health decisions with. Thank you. Let me just quickly follow up on this. Uh, I think specifically with regard to, you know, biological factors for inter-individual variability, you know, this experiment probably, you know, is going to tell us something about the overall mechanism. But going back to the how these experiments begin, you know, do regulators or policy, you know, folks within the agencies really have the say in what the – research arms of agencies or academic communities do, because I think there is a bit of a disconnect about what interesting science means to an academic versus what interesting useful science may mean to a regulator. So how do you see that you know, bridge uh, being built? Yvonne, can I, can I step in? I'm not sure if you can hear me uh, on the phone here. Yeah, we can. Uh, this is uh, Zach, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and am, am I loud, too loud, or is this an uh, acceptable level? So everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay. So I, I think uh, just on the point of sort of uh, research needs, I think one thing that's interesting is, um, and just to give a, a very brief background, uh, I, I work on air quality pollutants and regulatory uh, decision making. So I, I actually have designed and worked on a number of the risk assessments focusing on criteria pollutants, which are PM, ozone, sort of pollutants that we evaluate at the national or regional level and set national standards. And, I, and one thing that we end up doing with, with our risk assessments is, really trying to characterize uncertainty related to the risk assessments, and often that uncertainty involves factors related to biological variability and response, often looking at, at nonlinearities in the concentration response functions, which could reflect, you know, different subpopulations being kind of aggregated in the response and an ability to possibly tease out those different populations. That could be one, one thing that's going on. And we'll identify often at the end of our risk assessments critical areas of uncertainty and, and I think, um, and, then, and then when the next review cycle rolls around, we'll look at the literature that's been released since that initial, since the last time that we reviewed that particular pollutant and did a risk assessment. And often it's pretty clear that that um, that those points that we identified weren't really taken up, that they, they sort of got lost in the documentation, I guess. And I think that that's a point of, of a little bit of frustration from our perspective is how to sort of bridge that that step between the, the, you know, the academics who often conduct the epidemiology studies or do the research uh, and, and have them, for instance, in the con context of epidemiology or biokinetic modeling, other things like that, it, really look at those key uncertainties and, and recognize that if they you know, included additional survey questions or if they focused on a subpopulation, uh, the information that would be returned could be very valuable in terms of refining the risk estimate. So I, just to speak to that issue that I think in some ways that information is out there, and I think ORD and NCIA, the research development arm of EPA, does a good job, I think, of trying to bridge that and communicating with researchers through a variety of documents. But I think that that still remains sort of a bridge that isn't always connected, and I think that's um, – and I'm not sure if – Part of what could be done is, is better outreach on our part, the agency, to present risk assessments in, in sort of the, the literature and talk at conferences about some of these key areas. And that's something that I've talked with folks here about. But just, just acknowledge the importance of that and, and that I think that's an area that could, be, um, that, that could be very fruitful if we did a better job of communicating that. Thank you. Uh, let's go to the microphones and see you know, if we have a couple of questions. So please introduce yourself. Okay. Mike Dorson, Toxicology Excellence for Risk Assessment, a comment. And this is on questions one and two, I believe. So I've been doing risk assessment now for 32 years. It's a long time. And I've gone all the way from 10 to something else. And I want to make a comment that bridges to our academic community. Better understanding of molecular factors is highly desired by risk assessment people everywhere. But you have to integrate your information into a format that we can use, so a touchstone, because we can't get to where you are unless you, you work with us. 
Fortunately, there's guidelines out in chemical specific adjustment factors. Health Canada has a set of guidelines at back 1994. IP International Program of Chemical Safety 2005, US EPA just recently 2011. These are guidelines that help you take your data and fold it into a format or a way that we can use to replace existing default uncertainty factors. So as to questions one and two, if you're using these guidelines, if you're not familiar with these guidelines, you should be because then you can fold in your academic research or other research into a format that we can actually use and we can use to adjust the, the typical default uncertainty factors we now do. So that's just a comment for questions one and two. Thank you. So, uh, so let me just, you know, maybe briefly follow up on this. Uh, I don't think, you know, anyone wishes to make all academic research be, you know, applied uh, only to regulatory questions, but there's clearly a gap on how this information and what the needs are is passed on to the academic community. So I think maybe, you know, EPA through, you know, National Center for Environmental Research and NIEHS and other uh, federal government organizations that do provide grants should think of better ways to communicate the important questions as a straw man through, you know, program announcements or other things where, you know, they may welcome a certain type of research and, you know, communicate certain types of guidelines on the type of information that may need to be collected to be most useful. Uh, and I think this is something that we hope that will, uh, you know, continue internal discussion at the agencies that are represented here through their liaisons. Well, um, let me then uh, maybe move to the third question. And uh, uh, Zach, can you, um, you know, maybe tackle this? Because I think we've touched on the uh, on the tenfold factor and the uh, you know default versus science driven, and uh, you know some of the later questions touch on this as well. But uh, what can you tell us, uh, you know, from your point of view? And again, practically speaking, is it worth the effort uh, to collect more data? to replace the uncertainty factor, or do you feel that in many instances the uncertainty factor that is default, you know, is doing a good job? So how do we spend countless time collecting more data when we will arrive maybe at the same or close to factor at the end? Well, Vina, you know, I, I think, um, and let me just be sort of honest here in terms of the, the, the area that I've been working in, you know, having focused more on the criteria or pollutant side of things, um, you know, we tend to, it, so, so I'm going to do a little bit of a, a dodge, but I think bring up an important um, sort of angle to this issue, which is the criteria pollutant side. Uh, you know, these uncertainty factors that you're talking about, I think, have more play um, traditionally in the hazardous air pollutant side of things, where we, uh, which in, in the regulations that generally focus on those are regulations that are focused on specific industries, for instance, chemical waste incinerators, where you may have a mix of metals or organics, and the, the concentration response functions and the risk assessments are based on uh, animal tox-based uh, information or, or um, you know, uh, um, occupational uh, exposure data. Uh, in the, the other side of this, which isn't highlighted in this question, but I think it's very important, is in the criteria pollutant side where we have epidemiology studies um, focusing on, on deriving concentration response functions between, for instance, ambient exposures to PM and ozone or, or lead, blood lead values, and response. And this uncertainty factor, this issue of biological variability is just as relevant in that context. We typically don't use uncertainty factors in that context because we have an actual you know, relationship between ambient exposure, for instance, or some surrogate for exposure and, and disease response in the population, for instance, again, with ozone or PM or, or lead with blood lead and IQ loss in children. But this very real issue of, of feeling that in certain instances we may have um, a, a risk assessment that covers the general population, but we know from underlying tox information or clinical studies that there are subpopulations of concern that are not covered is, is critical. And the statutes governing certainly the criteria policy, pollutant side of, of things really calls directly for us to look at protecting sensitive subpopulations. So while we're not supposed to generate a regulation that protects the most sensitive individual, so, you know, the, the single person who may be highly responsive, if we have a subpopulation, a subgroup, a relatively small number of individuals that are, are sensitive, um, because of biological variability would be one, one reason, um, we really are charged to, to uh, protect that, that subpopulation. And often our data are limited in that, that regard. So I think, 
um, there's great utility because, you know, if we can provide administrators and decision makers with risk assessments, risk estimates for a subpopulation that's known and definable, um, that, that could play a critical role. And, and from a public health protection standpoint, is obviously a goal of the agency and would be important. Um, I can give a very quick example of this. Uh, in the context of lead, we, we did a, a major tightening of that standard several years ago, and we're in a review again. But with lead, we know, for instance, the children that are dietarily uh, deficient, um, you know, they're going to have greater potential uptake of lead per unit exposure because their bodies are, are t trying to take up calcium and other metals. And uh, in that context, we knew this was the case. However, our biokinetic variability, or uh, excuse me, our biokinetic modeling that we're using to, to model exposure really couldn't explicitly cover that subpopulation of children. So when we went to policymakers in the agency and said, you know, here are our risk estimates, we had to talk qualitatively about the fact that a subgroup of this population could experience greater risk, but we couldn't quantify that. Now, that, that quantitative, excuse me, that qualitative information can be used and becomes part of the, the dialogue and decision making. But clearly, you know, we knew that if we could, if we had the ability to quantitatively reflect that um, greater susceptibility in um, in modeling blood lead and then IQ loss for this subset of children, uh, we'd be able to provide a, a more focused assessment uh, of public, public health impact for that group associated with different standards that were being considered. So just to illustrate the fact that in that case, we felt a real push um, as sort of as risk assessors to try to characterize this. Available data didn't, didn't, didn't allow that to be done. And, um, and therefore, um, you know, we, we, we felt that the risk assessment and while comprehensive in a lot of ways could have been stronger in that regard. So I think the answer to the question, just come back to the question, I think there's a lot of practical utility in trying to, to characterize these factors. Specifically, the, the tenfold uncertainty factors related to the, sort of the HAPS world, I think any time you're using uh, an uncertainty factor that's more generic to cover um, you know, a magnitude of effect that can vary, that could be greater or lesser when it was characterized, you carry that piece of information up the chain as you, as you advance those risk estimates, and you have to say this, there's uncertainty, it's reflected in this factor. But then I, I think the, the dialogue back and forth with industry and with enviros and, and with the agency then uh, becomes more challenging because you're, you're, you're using a factor that, that has some degree of protectiveness, but you're not sure how protective that is. So you always want better information. So um, hopefully that provides a little, little context. Let me quickly follow up on this, uh, and hopefully you've uh, heard the presentations yesterday on the types of data, you know, that can be collected, you know, from in vitro to animal to, you know, computational models to human studies, as you alluded to. Do you see, uh, you know, a, of course, you know, we probably all would want to have the data, as you described, for lead or something else, which comes from actual susceptible population or for humans, but what would be the openness of the regulators to use some of the in vitro or, or animal-derived uh, information to potentially, you know, assist with understanding whether or not the default uncertainty factor should still apply or whether that should be substituted by data that doesn't come necessarily from exposed humans but from some other model system? Do you think there will be a, you know, a tremendous uh, obstacle in introducing some of the data into regulation or risk assessment? You know, in, the, in that context, I, I've learned a long time ago that, that when you don't have a lot of direct experience uh, in, in a particular regulatory area, you want to be careful about speaking to it. So, you know, I don't work in the HAPS world. So I, I, in terms of the, the, you know, the receptiveness of the agency to uh, using animal-based sort of relational data on susceptibility, um, you know, to, to adjust, you know, hu the, the sort of the human human um, values. I, that's not an, an area that I have experience, and I, I would um, sort of look to anybody else on the panel that, that has, and I, I apologize for that. Um, like I said, on the criteria pollutant side, um, certainly, you know, in that context, we use the han animal data to often try to identify potential mechanisms and then to, to provide support uh, from the epidemiology side for statistically based signals that we see. So obviously, in that context, animal studies provide a sort of mechanistic support for strengthening something which sometimes can be sort of, a, you know, a, an association that, that's not, you know, obviously causal unless you can demonstrate um, mechanisms. But I, unfortunately, I don't want to, I don't want to hand wave on, on the, the potential utility of the, you know, the tox stuff directly um, in the context of concentration response functions that might be based on toxicological uh, information themselves. I'm not sure if anybody else there has uh, any other input. This is Wei Shui. Um, I, I mean, I guess there, and there's no reason in principle why it couldn't be done. Uh, 
And um, without specific human data, I would give the example of the age-dependent adjustment factors for early life exposures for cancer, which are, and the default factors that you would apply for a mutagenic um, carcinogen are based primarily on animal data. And so uh, with from neonatal exposures, et cetera. So in principle, there's no reason why you cannot use animal data to um, inform the value of a human variability factor as if, if you have, you know, Good justification and, and peer review and all that, it you know goes into how that would be done. Shukmei, well, I uh, um, Shukmei Ho, uh, University of Cincinnati, and also a member of the committee. I I have a, a couple of comments. So the first one is that do we need more data, more science, in order to make a decision? In my view, is that we may not, because if you look at the his the BPA. Uh, it's already been banned in many states. It's not because we have more data. It's because of the movement of, this, of the community, you know, making it happen. So, so that's one point. Um, the second point is about um, individual variabilities. Can we uh, identify the most at risk, uh, most vulnerable population? Um, in my view is that maybe we should change it a little bit and think about can we identify the most at risk life stage or life stages that is important, and then maybe deal with those stages instead of trying to keep digging into like who is the most, uh, who are the most susceptible populations. And finally, I think it's really important for us to uh, look at uh, sort of human variabilities from a perspectives of internal doses. So internal doses is actually an and all the metabolites associated with the chemicals are, are really very important. And right now we have very little capacity in the nation to actually analyze large population and give a high throughput. And, and can, I, can I respond to that just uh, for a second? I think um, the, the age, just talking about the age groups, uh, certainly when we talk about susceptible populations and highly susceptible populations, um, you know, a critical factor there is is the age range that we're talking about. So, for instance, in lead, we know that there can be effects in adults that are exposed. There's some challenges in modeling those those effects because of endogenous lead exposure, um, your your own dosing of yourself given prior exposures. Um, but uh, we focus on children because they're the most vulnerable and susceptible for a variety of exposure and biological uh, related factors. So, I think that's uh, that's important. That's definitely an important factor and one that we certainly consider in, in air, air pollution modeling. Right. Well, I, I appreciate your comments. And uh, the thing is that I, I, I hate to see you sell your science short. You're an excellent scientist, have generated tremendous data sets. And I think that those need to be incorporated into this uh, safety assessment of BPA. And there's probably many other scientists out there like your data incorporated as well. So I think it really comes down to, you know, having the data sets uh, available to, to make sound regulatory decisions and, and not based on a, on a community movement of some type. Now, not, having said that, I think there's plenty of evidence that in order to uh, actually uh, get Congress and others uh, interested in moving certain areas forward, uh, such as supporting uh, ch children's health, uh, you do need a community movement behind that. Uh, they're not necessarily going to be making the final decisions, but they are going to be generating interest and hopefully support to get that work done. And I just want to make another quick comment about, uh, you know, the life stage studies. These are really critical. They're, they're very, very critical. Uh, but, but I think it's important that we understand that uh, it's not as though uh, you can always predict uh, what's going to happen uh, in utero or in a, in a neonate uh, by looking at adult data. I think we all accept that. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's not necessarily always the case uh, that uh, one, one life stage is just uh, absolutely more sensitive than the other. We really have to understand what's behind this. And, and I think it's really important as we move through animal models to try to predict uh, human developmental toxicity that we really understand the value of those animal models and what they can predict and what they can't predict. Uh, I think it came from some discussions yesterday uh, about some of these agents that uh, the, the rate of metabolism. Well, we have to include a lot more than just broad generalizations about the rate of metabolism being different in a neonate uh, versus an adult. Uh, you really have to understand more about that particular chemical uh, in that particular animal species because uh, most animal species have a different developmental sequence in terms of the rapidity in which they go through uh, the embryo stage and the fetal stage and, 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 and growth postnatally. That all has to be considered when you interpret those data. And we have to understand that, that uh, humans are more like non-human primates than they are like mice and rats, especially during the reproductive cycle. Uh, 
in the non-human primate, you have a functional fetal placental unit. Uh, you have a maternal uh, fetal rate ratio that's very similar to the human situation, single births, a lot of things, placental type, uh, the, the activity of the enzymes. Uh, those are quite uh, similar, more similar uh, between, let's say, pr uh, non-human primate species and humans than it would be necessarily to uh, rats or mice. So all those things have to be considered. You can't just uh, make generalizations without really understanding all those features in a simultaneous way. Yes. Uh, Joyce Suji, exponent, also member of the committee. Um, I think for number three, before you can decide whether the tenfold is adequate or not, you have to look at where are you starting from. Are you basing it on a NOEL or no effect level or a lowest effect level that has a lot of data or is it data poor? Is it based on a subpopulation of people that are most sensitive? Uh, and so now you're, you're pretty confident of where you're at, in which case a tenfold is probably too big. And what is the basis of the toxicity at the lowest doses? Not the high doses, but at the lowest doses. Does it have to do with metabolism of uh, an enzyme metabolism of a key? Uh, I mean, is it, is it an enzyme rate of a key metabolite that's important? For some things like TCE, the amount of variability in that enzyme is not, not important because of liver perfusion rate controlling the amount of expression, as Harvey uh, illustrated yesterday. For other things like the aldehydes, um, Enzyme um, polymorphism really does matter. So in that case, you have to take those things into account. Um, the other thing I wanted to throw out there is that a lot of the animal studies, and anytime you do these tox studies, whether they be in vitro or animal studies, usually it's constant dose for, for a defined period. And the problem with that is in the environment, humans are often exposed to spikes. And then when you go out and measure what they're exposed to, often it's an average. And so now you have a disconnect. Maybe the humans at the same average dose are showing effects because they're really responding to the spikes. So until you look at what mechanisms are happening and what's going on, I think you don't have a lot of data to understand um, is the tenfold adequate or not. Thank you. Uh, let's take one more question, then we'll, we'll, we'll keep more questions coming, but I wanted to move down in some of our questions as well. So Thank you. Uh, Albert Donega, this time I do really have a question, and it's for Zach. Thank you for explaining this very important distinction between how EPA handles the criteria pollutants reviews essentially without any consideration specifically of uncertainty factors, but as I understand it, just looking at the uncertainty in the data you have and which population the studies are based on and so on compared to other pollutants where we do use these uncertainty factors. And I think there's a disconnect between these two processes because even when EPA has definitively defined a population at risk, and I come back to the CO example in men like myself with angina, the data they're relying on showed a negative 40 to positive 40 percent response to the same levels of carbon monoxide. <laughs> and there's clearly huge variability, including one-third of the subjects in this study who are not protected at the level EPA said would be the margin of safety. So how did EPA, in looking at this, and they just reissued the rule last August, decide within this sensitive population where to draw that cutoff that, as you said, doesn't have to take in every individual, right? It's allowed to leave out the most sensitive individual, but somewhere between that and the, and the full third, how did you draw that line? So, you know, I, I and unfortunately, because your, your question is very, is, is, is pollutant focused on CO, I, I wasn't involved in that particular analysis. I can tell you that, um, you know, epidemiology is, is, and I'm not sure if the, if the response you're talking about is a clinical study response or an epi clinical. study response. This was a clinical study. Right, right. So, you know, obviously with clinical studies, I mean, one of the biggest concerns you have there is you have a relatively small subset of individuals, so you don't know whether you're capturing the most at risk, although you can certainly target, um, you know, individuals who have existing, pre-existing conditions or genetic, uh, you know, characteristics. And so in that case, um, see whether they have a different response. Obviously, the problem is even within a, a population, a defined population, a clinical study is only going to be able to look at a certain number of individuals, and you're not going to be able to get that, that kind of refined characterization of exposure and response that might be occurring for a subset of them at, at lower levels. Obviously, an epi study has the benefit of having a much larger N, a much larger sample size, but then you get exposure misclassification concerns such that it's sometimes hard to tease that out. And so these often become, you know, issues – 
uh, having to do with the design and the strengths and limitations of both. And and um, on, on sort of not speaking specifically to the decision you're talking about, which unfortunately, I, like I said, I didn't work on that pollutant. But I will say this, I think often what I've experienced is we'll spend you know a fair amount of resources and effort trying to characterize uncertainty when if we went back and collected additional data, did a better job of, of attempting to characterize exposure misclassification, really getting information on where people live, where they work, where they commute, uh, and some of their own their, their individual factors, you know, acknowledging concerns over an, an, anonymity issues, um, we might be able to get a much more focused characterization of risk that doesn't suffer from some of the some of the limitations of on the clinical side or the exposure misclassification. On the clinical side, if you can obviously increase your 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 size of your sample that you actually study, you get a you get a, the ability to characterize some of those lower exposure responses that you see and identify subgroups. So, um, it, you know, I think some of what I know I've experienced is, you know, limitations in the data that we're getting, which reflect some of the the, the technical limitations of those study designs. And then, you know, we're left with a fairly fuzzy signal at times or negative findings. Sometimes it looks like a pollutant is positive from a health standpoint. You know there's no mechanistic way that that could be the case, that that's probably, a, you know, an epi limitation of the epidemiology study. So um, I, I hear your point. Well, actually, i got to interrupt you on that. The, the clinical study, Sorry. Um, the clinical study, and in fact a series of seven clinical studies that EPA funded for... Uh, <laughs> a decade in the 80s, they all found that half these subjects got better after CO exposure. So there is, this is that minus 40 to plus 40 variability I'm talking about. Uh, CO does make people, some people better, and there are mechanistic explanations for it in okay. the literature. But please give an example that you are familiar with, with PM or ozone. How does EPA decide where to cut the line within the sensitive population? When you see a spread of dose response in that sensitive group, some are more sensitive than others. You know, it's animal farm. Where do you cut the line? Sure. Well, what I'll what I'll say there, and, and I'm sorry because I'm not there. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I, I certainly, it's in person. It's easier to to be more civil that way. So I, I didn't mean to do that. Um, I think one of the big challenges we ha have is often, you know, certainly in the case of PM, uh, you know, the NC the ORD's review of the literature and our own review suggests that there's no concentration response threshold. And so what you're left with is the fact that, you know, instances where it looks like, uh, you know, there's good support for some degree of risk, uh, you know, across the exposure spectrum. And then, you're, you know, you're left, you know, with an effort to characterize the magnitude of that actual impact. And then at lower levels, your ability to characterize that response um, becomes uncertain because you don't have a lot of people exposed at those lower levels. I mean, the reality is as we tighten standards, then ambient, you know, cities are, are left sort of sitting at, at those standards, and you ask the question, well, what would it mean to go to a lower standard? And you don't have a lot of instances where there are individuals at those lower standards. So, you know, my experience has been when we have studies that, that focus on some of the populations you're talking about that, that, have, that, that have reasonable confidence in characterizing that response, we would clearly convey that, and we would try to, in fact, we would focus on those populations. Um, there's a, a, a technical nuanced um, issue here, which, which I'm not sure we really want to get into right now, but has to do with the fact that usually we focus on making population risk estimates. So we want to make incidence estimates of actual disease cases. And one of the problems with some of the subpopulations of concern and interest to us is we don't have the underlying baseline rates of disease for those populations in different cities. And so sometimes making population risk estimates, and this is a, a nuanced point, is limited, and we, and we haven't always focused on individual risk and characterizing an individual risk. If we moved in that direction, we might be able to include greater coverage for special populations of concern because we could be dealing with individual risk and not have to look at some of the baseline incidence factors that are, that are involved. This is sort of a nuanced point, but um, one that, if, that we're having some internal discussions about this because I think that would allow us to look quantitatively at some of the subgroups um, of, of interest, some of the genetic, genetic, uh, genetically differentiated groups, for instance, with ozone and some of the long-term uh, endpoints. So that, that's, that's not really necessarily a direct answer to your question, but um, Thank you, Zach. I guess my point is we're trying to sort of move in that direction. To the Thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I think this is, uh, you know, a, a good time for us to uh, go to the next question, which is really not, you know, I think thus far we've been talking about what inter-individual variability means in terms of, you know, the, the pathways and the mechanisms and, uh, you know, and also, you know, whether it affects a point of departure or some, some number that we can 
use them for regulation, but I think dose response is also an important consideration and maybe inter-individual variability in some of the data that is, is being collected can tell us more about the dose response. So I just wanted to ask Wei Shui to share his opinion on this. So I was designed this very non-controversial question about linear versus nonlinear dose response. Um, so ideally, I'm, I'm going to actually reframe the question in terms of linear versus nonlinear extrapolation, not dose response per se, because if you have data showing one or the other, or you can statistically test for whatever, that's, that's a separate topic. So my, my, my own perspective, not speaking for EPA, is that um, ideally we should be able to, hopefully the, the human variability data will allow us to, to more often avoid extrapolation and to be able to estimate empirically rather than extrapolate those response in the exposure ranges of, of interest. And I'm going to give two kind of you know, examples based on the, all the talks yesterday and some of the discussion today. One is from epidemiologic data, and as mentioned by Dr. Rothman yesterday, the hope is that with better human variability information, you will be able to more smartly stratify and sort of pick out dose response in the more susceptible populations. And because they're more susceptible, you will be able to pick out dose response at lower exposures. Um, so, uh, so this would have several benefits. One is being able to have sort of an identifiable subgroup um, if you have, and you know, if you have inf information on the prevalence of that subgroup in the population uh, that you that, that the regulatory uh, or the decision is uh, is related to, then that'll often be the driver of the overall population dose response, and so that that will will help there. Um, and then the other thing is that if you have other human variability and susceptibility data on that same endpoint, for instance, from non-chemical stressors and um, pre-existing conditions, genetic polymorphisms, then perhaps you can also make um, some predictions as to the combined effect of the chemical and those other multiple stressors. And that was illustrated in Dr. Schwartz's sort of um, hypothetical example yesterday with uh, um, you know, diabetes and, and, and um, myocardial infarction and, and et cetera. So, and then perhaps with some broader exposure data uh, on that this might be possible with more and more uh, sort of exposome kind of things, maybe this, would, this kind of approach might be possible for more and more chemicals. So that's sort of the epi side of it. So even so, there will be left with lots of chemicals that which we probably won't have human exposure data on in the exposure range of interest, chemicals that haven't been studied, new chemicals, chemicals that are part that all the data are mostly at higher occupational levels, say. And here, I think that the data can, can help clarify um, sort of uh, human variability data on the endpoint in particular, uh, not necessarily tied to the chemical, will be helpful in the following way, and sort of in a way that, um, that Jim had mentioned earlier in terms of trying to, trying to integrate sort of across fields. Um, first is sort of information on the nature of the endpoint. So the role of stochasticity versus deterministic processes in sort of the disease progression. Um, what characteristics confer greater or less risk? Um, uh, Jim and Dr. Shaw yesterday talked about stratified medicine, and that is sort of a window into the disease etiology um, because some patients respond to some medications versus the other. So really this sort of diseases, uh, things that are are classified as single diseases are really multiple diseases. And so it may be drawing on this other NRC report on precision medicine, uh, moving towards sort of a more molecular taxonomy of disease, um, we'll be able to sort of, we'll be able to understand these endpoints uh, it, better in terms of well, what is the, the actual thing that is, that is not functioning uh, in, the, in the, the particular subclass of disease. So why is this useful? Um, so at the simplest level from uh, like in, in uh, Duncan Thomas's presentation yesterday, if you have information on baseline risk and then you have some other information on sort of absolute risk uh, in a more homogeneous population, you, you automatically sort of have a spread of slopes uh, in, you know, when you, when you transfer, extrapolate, you know, the, let's say an animal study on a homogeneous population to a more diverse population. Just, just by virtue of having different baseline risks, there will be different slopes. Um, and then, in addition, you can consider developing perhaps models for sort of these indicators of risk, um, sort, of, sort of an indicator effect um, uh, uh, re relationship with it, w uh, not talking about the chemical you're interested in, but these, these other indicators of, uh, that confer uh, risk. And then, um, and then use experimental systems to, to um, whether they're in vitro or in vivo in the future, to, uh, to, 
understand the dose to the indicator risk. I mean, just as a crude example, you know, birth weight, uh, the reduced birth weight mentioned example I mentioned yesterday is associated with all sorts of things, neonatal uh, death, as well as uh, uh, effects lo- uh, later in life. Um, and then, so that c- so, so then you can use the experimental animal data on reduced birth weight to sort of do the full extrapolation from the toxicity of the chemical to these other, uh, other effects that you can actually you know, produce uh, benefits analyses or other valuations on. Um, but to, to be able to move that even further upstream to, to earlier indicators for which we have information on the sort of indicator dose response in the population and the variability and susceptibility factors, et cetera, uh, but then use the experimental systems to, to, um, to discern sort of the relationship with, with exposure. Let me see if there are any questions to, to follow up on this discussion. I don't actually have one for which way, but I have something that probably applies to about three other questions. Okay. <laughs> Let me then just quickly uh, ask a question of which way. So I think the reality is that we're not going to get too much more data from model systems like humans where, you know, we will have less of a knee-jerk reaction. I think many more data on on, you know, much more data on many more chemicals will come from in vitro systems. So how do you see that information? Because, you know, those, most of those experiments are concentration response that are covering, you know, orders of magnitude. Is there, you know, some valuable information there that can be brought into, you know, these various types of dealing with this information, those response for the actual, you know, uh, decision-making context? Right. So the other half of that is that there's going to be variability in the exposure res- exposure to the intermediate indicator, and so these model systems, if they the you know mouse panels or or human or in vitro uh, human cell um, groups of uh, different genetically diverse cells, that can be used to discern that kind that the variability uh, the chemical specific variability and sort of distinguish that from the non chemical specific variability, um, bringing in all the information from um, you know more basic biology and, and medicine. So maybe uh, Harvey, uh, quickly. This was actually on waste waste uh, uh, comment. I was wondering uh, to what extent you think that the uh, the data on this, okay, I'll say it, the small number of chemicals that have good epidemiology data, someone will hit me for that, but come on, compared to the thousands of chemicals we're trying to uh, get information on, uh, to what extent that can inform uh, f- uh, for uh, uh, other chemicals and, you know, how you would go about trying to determine whether the mode of action or the relationship between exposures and effects is, is uh, uh, well, I guess, extrapolable. Um, so I, I think the, the missing link is having is sort of calibrating the new experimental systems um, to these cases where we have uh, human epidemiologic data and having some common, um, some, some common metric to, to extrapolate between them. So the... Huh? So, the no, 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 not an uncertainty factor. But just, um, but so the, from the yesterday the discussion of benzene, where you have the human epi data on benzene, hematologic markers, and then they're doing experiments in these mouse panels on benzene, hematologic markers. I mean, how much concordance, uh, first, you know, you want to know, well, how much concordance is there, um, you know, between the species? Um, is, can we, are there adequate, are there ways to adjust for the, for the, those species differences so that we can get sort of a, a calibrated system and then sort of extrapolate that to other things that affect hematological parameters um, for which we don't have human data so uh, let me uh, you know in the five minutes or so that we have remaining you know bring a pivot back to you know do we or don't we need more data? And does more data just leads to more discussion? And uh, more discussion thus, you know, stalls the process. And I wanted to add, ask, uh, you know, Dan to maybe address the, the fifth question with uh, a few comments. Um, okay, I will try to be brief. Um, there's been a lot to react to, uh, even since I originally prepared my uh, response to this question, but I'll try to condense it. Um, these comments represent my position, not necessarily that of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Um, So I think this particular question, question number five, is framed back in the context of uh, reference doses, whereas the last question we're sort of departing from reference doses. When I first looked at the ordering of the questions, I thought that didn't work, but it's actually great to follow that question because I want to pull them together in some way. Um, I think so. 
as uh, some of the speakers yesterday and this morning have already brought out, uh, there are different decision-making contexts. There are different statutes that the decisions are made under. Um, and there are different kinds of risks associated with non-cancer effects that we're looking at when you're developing a, a reference dose. So there's a lot of different choices about uh, how the risk assessment can be done. Uh, the question reference science and decisions, and in that report, one of the many things that was recommended was that uh, there should be more dialogue between risk assessors and risk managers up front in designing the content of a risk assessment going through a planning and scoping process. And EPA is now developing a framework document to uh, implement those recommendations. Rita Shoney, who's here, is, is leading that. And I think that's, that provides us a setting for thinking about the, this question about um, to, to what extent do you want to refine particular inputs going into a reference dose? Um, do you want sort of, a, there really is no such thing as a standard RFD, but I'll use that term just as shorthand here. Uh, is a, a standard RFD going to be sufficient and appropriate? Ah, RFD is reference dose, I'm sorry for the uh, abbreviation. Is that going to be uh, suitable for a particular decision, or are you going to need something that's more fine-tuned? I think that's something that can emerge, hopefully, in some sense from that dialogue, from that planning and scoping process. Um, uh, to, to what extent, in a particular assessment, do you want to look at this? I think there's sort of a separate question about uh, the 10X and question number three about I think that refers more towards the general context of is 10 the right number for a default adjustment as opposed to here we're talking about in a particular assessment, how far do you go in exploring uh, data that you might have specific to that chemical. Um, but I also want to think about, the, again, the breadth of decision context. And uh, John Balbus raised this morning the question about quantifying health benefits and how important that can be for decisions. And we had some discussion about the role of the Office in Ma of Management and Budget in reviewing regulations. And um, you know, we may have different opinions about that role of OMB and how they carry it out, but they're not going away. And I think there's going to be more and more need for really exploring what are the quantifiable benefits that uh, EPA can calculate and present as part of that deliberation. Um, so that's something that really takes you away from the reference dose, um, which is you can't translate into benefits because it doesn't give you in itself the capability to compare risks at different level of exposure. So when I think about this question of more refined variability analysis, we have more data lots of different kinds of data that are in some way informing our understanding of human variability and response. If we have enough data to sort of do this, to contemplate doing some sort of refined uh, uncertainty factor for a reference dose, I, I, in lots of contexts, but I think that would enable us to, instead of fine tuning the RFD, let's think about can we get to something that gives us a dose response relationship so we can do that sort of benefits calculation and put that into our overall cost benefit calculus that we are taking not just to OMB but to the public to explain the basis for why is EPA taking this action, why did it choose a particular level uh, in setting that regulation. So uh, I guess the answer is you're not concerned? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or uh, it depends on the decision I, context? I, I'm, I'm always concerned about how much work uh, goes into an analysis and how long it's going to take uh, to do that analysis. Lots of EPA decisions have to be made on a particular schedule. Um, uh, and also, if it takes us a long time to do an analysis, uh, the longer it takes to get to doing risk management, then you've got more time that people are being exposed. So I think that always has to be a consideration. I'm hoping that as we go more and more towards a formalized uh, planning and scoping, where you have this dialogue between the risk managers and the risk assessors, um, that those concerns can be balanced out. I think it will always be a concern and a trade-off between depth of analysis and how quickly we can get to decisions and actually taking protective actions where warranted. Thank you. Let, let me just you know, quickly go to microphones, maybe for, for comments rather than questions, and uh, I would welcome okay. if they can be brief. No, actually, mine now, does now follow nicely after what Dan said, Ivan, so thank you. 
Uh, first of all, I'm Kerry Deerfield from the Department of Agriculture Food Safety and Inspection Service. The first observation I really do want to make is that it's not only EPA and FDA that do risk assessments. There are a lot of other federal agencies that do risk assessment. For example, uh, the, the fantastic stuff that Eric Schatz showed us yesterday on all the stuff about E. coli, we definitely use that type of stuff in our risk assessments and looking at the food, uh, uh, looking at food safety. Second point is I've been standing here for so long, I, I forgot my question. No, seriously. Um, what I'd like to do is I, I don't have a real hard question, so I would just like to relate a story as short as I can, but it does get to this idea of how you look at population versus individual risk and also what types of tests that we think we are going to be needing for uh, these risk assessments. A couple of years ago, uh, EPA did come to us at the USDA and said, you know, a lot of your cattle are being exposed to PFCs in the environment, perforinated compounds. They're being applied by biosolids on, the, on fields, and your cattle are eating this, uh, eating the, you know, the, uh, the, um, the grass and stuff are coming off this field. So the questions come to us is that, well, can we eat this meat? And also, are the people who eat this uh, uh, and drink there, can they actually sell their, their cattle and stuff because they've now been exposed to PFCs? So the question came to us is almost immediate. So here's the timing. How much data do you need at the, at the exact point to make a decision to say, yes, you can go ahead and sell your cattle? You can't wait six months for, a, uh, you know, for, for that type of decision to be made. So we went ahead and did a, what we thought was a very good risk assessment. We looked at you know, the, the antics and the, did a lot of exposure analysis, looked at the, you know, the, uh, the different ranges of uh, variability of the people who, who eat, stuff like that. So we took into account a lot of this stuff. Let's just say we did a, a, a wonderful risk assessment. So, we come, so I had to go down there and stand in front of all these people and say, okay, based on our estimates, okay, you are okay to sell your cattle. You're okay if you eat stuff from this cattle. And so that was based on sort of the, the, what we thought would be the variability, the worst case scenario and all this kind of stuff. We thought, well, we had captured everybody's you know, concerns in our, in our estimates. Well, the first question that came back was, well, what about me? And I said, well, well we took you into a, you know, you, I'm, we said it in much more plain language, I think, but we said we, we took that into account. We took you in you know, the worst case scenario and what would be the most, you know, most probable thing you had. We also calculated what would be the most likely types of uh, exposures and things like that. But they still kept coming back, what about me? So it comes down to what data do you have? You could have had the most beautiful molecular data. You could have had all this stuff. What they wanted was data about themselves. So eventually we had to go back. We had to take blood samples directly from them, which the CDC did. We had to go back and take and sacrifice animals from those different areas. We had to take direct measurements and then finally go back to them. I felt very good. I, had to, I went back and said what we had estimated in the, in the first place from the risk assessment was the correct decision. We did not find anything anomalous about that. So the question comes down to is how much data do you need to make real-time decisions? And do you want to wait for these molecular things? And then is this, I guess, another subsequent one is that these are beautiful techniques and everything we're talking about, but it comes back to they wanted that biological uh, measurement, which comes back to the old-time toxicology type of stuff. Thank you. I'm going to give the uh, you know, floor to Jim for just one second, and we'll move actually pivot right into that, you know, what type of data we can collect, which is our next panel. So, Yeah, I, I was just going to add we've been dancing around this, but we really don't have good biomarkers of exposure for these things. And if I had a biomarker of exposure, then I know whether I should be worried. Jim should be worried not the population. So part of this needs to have science generate those biomarkers. I, I, again, I apologize for not getting all the questions, but this has been a, you know, a good discussion, and I'd like to close this particular uh, session, and uh, let's thank the panelists.